Great. Looks good. So, uh, yes, as um, we just said, my name's Ewan Addy, and I'm from a company called Altmetric. So, maybe confusingly, we're called Altmetric, and that's the company name, but the field as a whole is called Altmetrics. Um, so, it's not like I represent all of Altmetrics. I'm just like one small part of it. <laughs> just in case you were wondering. Uh, so there's a lot of other Altmetrics tools available as well. So there's us, but there's also uh, the PLOS uh, article level metric system, which is an open source system um, that I think we're going to hear more about later on today. Uh, also, there's a couple of other groups, so Impact Story and Plum Analytics are the two big ones. So we've heard a lot about Altmetrics, I think, at the conference. It's been mentioned a few times. Uh, and what you may come to realize the more you hear about them is that everyone has a slightly different definition. It's all around the same thing, uh, but it's usually subtly different. And this is our definition. So Altmetrics, it's short for alternative metrics. And it's just new ways of measuring non-traditional forms of impact, sometimes on articles, but also sometimes on non-traditional outputs. So uh, we heard from... Vincent before, the journal articles are sometimes only a small part of the research output uh, of academics. So what about all this other stuff that we should be measuring? Very importantly, the alternative part is not an alternative to citations. It's not replacing citations. It's a complement to citations. So we're not saying stop, measure, stop using the impact factor, stop using citations, uh, use this stuff instead. What we're saying is use that stuff sensibly and also take into account these other metrics. So what are these other metrics? Well, every researcher is also a communicator. They work within academia, so they're producing uh, papers, they're writing book chapters and academic texts, um, they're talking at conferences, but they're also active within society as a whole. Uh, and that could be to do public outreach, where they're you know, actually talking to members of the public, uh, to write trade books. They're speaking to journalists. There's newspaper stories, magazine stories about research. They might be active on social media. And then more formally, they may be involved in uh, either directly or indirectly setting government policy. So the research that comes out of universities obviously informs government policy. Uh, and things like filing patents as well. So there's a, obviously a whole sphere of things happening outside of academia. And what our metrics are saying is we should measure both, right? We should look at both of these spheres. Um, and that's effectively what it is. It's the academic impact and societal impact is maybe the wrong word, but all of the other stuff. So, I was going to talk about our metrics in practice, and to do that, I'll use our experience. I said before, we're just one of a few different tools. Um, our focus is mainly on publishers, actually, so we work mainly with journal articles. Um, and we're very happy to have been able to work with a lot of uh, very good publishers, including Cielo, Brazil, um, and also some other companies, so Cell Press. Um, a lot of the BMJ journals just started using Elmetric a few days ago for Open Access Week, uh, the nature titles, this kind of thing. So it's a very young field. We're quite a new company, but there's still quite a lot of usage. So we serve about 2.5 million requests for Elmetric data every day. So it is getting out there. People do see Elmetrics. It's not always like great data, but they do see something. So getting straight down to the practice. And this is all metrics on a micro level. We're talking about article level metrics. So there's macro level metrics as well, but it's a kind of a different story. What we're looking at here is a report for a single article. It's an article that's done quite well. Uh, I won't go into great detail, but there's, there's really three main parts to it. Um, it's a little bit cut off by the screen, but so in the top left, you can see a kind of a round circle with a number in it. And that's what we call the Allmetric Donut. And I'll talk about that later. Um, and then underneath that, there's some other metrics. So it'll say the number of times that the paper has been seen on Twitter, the number of times it has been mentioned on a blog, this kind of thing. And then importantly, 
most of the space on the right-hand side is taken up with the actual data. So uh, it might be difficult to read here, but the numbers say there's a number 10 next to newspapers and magazines. So it's, we've seen it 10 times in different newspapers and magazines. But that means we'll also show you those 10 mentions. So you can see, OK, out of the 10, there's one from Der Spiegel there, there's one from BBC News, there's one from an Italian newspaper. And if I click through the tabs, I can start exploring that data. So we try and help you understand what it means. So for example, there's a demographics tab. And now we tell you where the people who have uh, talked about the article online, as far as we can tell, are from. So that's the, the geographic breakdown. And then also, in some cases, when we can get a profile for the people who are talking about the research, we can try and decide, are they a researcher? Are they a doctor? Are they a communicator, like a journalist, say? Um, or are they a member of the public? This is uh, quite new, as we'll hear about it soon. I'll explain maybe a little bit more how we do that in a bit. So that's what it looks like. But you know, why is it interesting? What does it have to do with impact? Um, and what can we do with it now? What is the practical applications of this? And the important thing to remember here is that uh, I think it was Mike Taylor who said this before. He's at uh, in Elsevier Labs. And he said, all metrics tools are at version 0.1. It's not like all metrics is ready right now to give you some magic numbers that make everything OK. It's that all metrics is just starting now to get this data. And Realistically, I think we're still three to five years away from the metrics part, the numbers part, to be useful. But that doesn't mean that our metrics as a whole isn't useful already for other things. So practically speaking, our metric tools don't yet provide good metrics for impact. There are some numbers you can pull out of them, but the numbers in general uh, aren't good for the types of impact that we're looking at now or the types of use cases that we have now for research or evaluation to measure the quality of a piece of work, this kind of thing. But what they can do is help you find evidence of impact that you maybe didn't know about before and that you can't ever find out about if you only use Scopus or Web of Science or uh, even like things like download counts. So here's a specific example of that. So we looked at a paper before that report uh, with the different newspaper stories. And it's an article about the ecological impact of the Fukushima disaster in Japan. So that's what the paper was about. And if you look to the demographics for that, you would see that there's been almost 2,000 different people on Twitter sharing the article. So they're, you know, we don't know why exactly they were sharing it, but they were you know, pushing it out there on their network. That their combined network, this is an upper bound of their followers, was about 2.5 million people. Obviously, not all of them will have seen the link or clicked on the link, but that's the upper bound. And then, interestingly, almost 70% of them came from Japan, and 77% of them had never tweeted about a paper before. It was the first time we'd ever seen them tweet about a piece of scientific research. So I'd suggest that that's evidence of public outreach. That may or may not be the type of impact that the authors wanted, but it certainly reached an audience there in Japan. And that's something that we wouldn't necessarily have been able to find out by citations because obviously a member of the public doesn't cite a paper if they've read one that's interesting, right? So it's a different kind of impact. Again, it's complementary to the bibliometrics. So here's a different, more local example. Uh, this is a paper from the University of Sao Paulo. Um, it's, about a, it's reporting on a clinical trial for a disease, for uh, fibromyalgia. I can never pronounce that very well. And if you look at the data they are collected, again, this is article level metrics, it's on the micro level. We see things like this, okay, so this is a tweet from uh, a researcher in the same field in the UK, and he's saying, okay, nice work from USP, here's the link uh, to PubMed, and there's a few other people that have retweeted it and shared it. So this, this, isn't, like, this is a very weak indicator, right? But uh, this may be better for your ego than for something on a grant application, but it, it's still evidence that a researcher globally has read your work and, and liked it. And this would happen within days of publication. So with citations in the biomedical sphere, you need to wait a year, a year and a half before you start seeing the citations come in. With a lot of the all metrics data, 
not patents and policy documents. They're the kind of the exception. But for a lot of the social media data, the newspapers, blogs, we see the half-life is three days. So three days after publication, you've had 50% of all the tweets, say, that you're going to get in the first year for an article. It's very quick to accrue, and it's very high volume, uh, well, at least some of the time. So going a little bit deeper, there was that tweet from a researcher. It's been picked up by a newspaper in the US, Chicago Tribune. Um, and more interestingly, maybe going back to the tweets, there's here. So this is a patient advocate group for the disease. And they're also linked to the paper. So now we're getting interesting. This is evidence that, again, very weak, an indicator rather, but it's some evidence that the paper has reached the people who it's ultimately trying to help. Uh, as a tangent, underneath, you can't see it very well, but there's a tweet. They've tweeted the paper link, and someone has replied saying, I can't read it. It's behind a paywall. So it's a good like, reason for open access there. Um, so I'll go quickly now through the numbers, things I said I would talk about the donut. So what we can measure is attention, like the level of attention that a, an article has received. Um, the number in the middle is what we call the Elmetric score. The colors around the sides are the different sources of attention. So red is newspapers, yellow is blogs, this kind of thing. And we can measure this attention, and here's where the limitations are. We can't tell you if it's positive, if it's negative. Was the paper getting attention because it was a great scientific paper? Or because it was about weight loss, cannabis, sex? All of those things get very popular attention uh, from the public on the internet. It's maybe not the kind of impact you want, but it is an impact, right? You choose whether or not you want it or not. And that's why context is everything. It's very important to always have the raw data behind the number at this point for you to go in and actually see for yourself why, why is the L-metric score like that. So I'm going to reiterate quickly. Um, in general numbers, and this stands for the L-metric score, but it also stands for you know, the number of newspaper stories or the number of patents coming out of the work, all of this kind of thing, they don't represent the quality of the research, right? They don't indicate the quality of the individual researcher who did it. You're not a better professor because you got 100 tweets rather than four tweets. Uh, you always need the whole story. You need to go in and look at the, the qualitative data to actually read what those things are and make your own assessment. Unfortunately, maybe, uh, but maybe we're not going to get past that gold standard, if you like. So the question is, why have any numbers at all right now before they're useful for evaluation? It's for ranking and for looking at the macro level stuff. So I can say things like, show me all the articles from the University of San Paolo and order them by the attention they've received. I'm not going to go through 1,000 papers one by one to look for evidence of impact, but maybe I can pull out the 100 that I should look at and then prioritize them. And the question of what we should be measuring beyond attention or on the Elmetric score is actually not one for tool makers. I don't think it's people in the Elmetrics community that should be answering that. It's actually you. It's, it's the, uh, the academic community and funders and the institutions themselves. And I think what we can do is say, here's the data we have, here's the kind of things we can do. And then it's up to individual communities to say, OK, right, in our field, it's very important to um, have distribution, like this amount of public outreach, or to reach this particular audience. Um, and then we can help build the tools to, to deliver that. But it needs to be a two-way street. I think the trap would be to say again, to rely on a third party to tell scientists what's good and what's bad. That should be coming from the scientific community. OK, so very quickly, uh, I'm just going to finish on uh, some problems with, the, with our metrics. So there's some well-recognized issues. Uh, and to some extent, they're true of citations as well, um, as we've heard. But because our metrics are still developing, I think they're a little bit worse for us. So one is coverage. Um, not every paper has a lot of our metric data. It's actually a relatively small amount. There's this long tail of papers that have just a little bit of attention. Uh, and it's worse in some disciplines. So again, like Vincent said this morning, in biomedical papers, There'll be a lot of our metrics and things, but in social sciences and humanities, it's much lower. And then also, more subtly, there's, there is a bias towards uh, data sources from the US, from Europe, uh, from Japan. So uh, that's evident when we started working with Cielo. We had to do quite a lot of work to start picking up Brazilian blogs and newspapers and uh, Latin American stuff in general. But it's 
even more apparent when you think about China, where Twitter and Facebook, they don't, they can't even get to them, right? It's completely censored. So uh, there's none of that data going in, and it's very difficult for us uh, in Europe to get data out of Chinese microblogging systems. You need a license from the government. There's all sorts of censorship issues. Um, so there's some, some big problems there that we need to tackle that we all need to be aware of. That said, ending on a more positive note, uh, and Mark Patterson mentioned this before, uh, things like initiatives like DORA are very important about thinking about how we could change research assessment for the better. And I'd suggest that you go to the website and, and read it for yourself uh, to find out more. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for listening.